The second argument is that the um, conventional doctrine leads to decisions concerning life and death made on irrelevant grounds. Consider again the case of the infant with Down syndrome who needs the operation for congenital defects unrelated to the syndrome to live. Sometimes there is no operation and the baby dies, is allowed to die. But when there is no such defect, the baby lives. Now, and I'll explain that. Now, an operation such as that to remove the intestinal obstruction is not pro, um, prohibitively difficult. It's an easy thing to do. The reason why such operations are not performed, the blockage removed, in these cases is clear. It is because the child has Down syndrome. And the parents and doctors judge that because of that fact, it is better for the child to die. And die in the manner we just said. Dehydration, withering away, atrophying of the muscles, just the putrid stench of the death. And as the Dr. Shaw says, the parents never set foot in the room. Right? They walk off with their narrative of the beauty of this child's death. When in fact the child died specifically from something that could have easily been treated by removing the intestinal blockage, the, the real reason for the, the child's allowing to die is because they had a, a defect. They weren't perfect. The, the defect, and they weren't perfect, right? They had Down syndrome. And for those parents whose child had Down syndrome and intestinal blockage, the child was allowed to die. But notice that this situation is absurd. No matter what view one takes, the lives and potentials of such babies. If the life of such an infant is worth preserving, what does it matter if it needs a simple operation? Or if one thinks it better that such a baby should not live, what difference does it make that it happens to have an obstructed intestinal tract? In either case, the matter of life and death is being decided on irrelevant grounds. It is the Down syndrome and not the intestinal blockage that is the issue. The matter should be decided, if at all, on the basis, on that basis, Down syndrome, which is really a hard decision. So the real question is, you, you, you just want to kill your baby because you, you, your baby has Down syndrome. I hate to sound vulgar. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but this is Rachel's, right? But you got to keep it funky. You really want to kill your baby because your baby has Down syndrome, right? Of course not. It's You really want to kill your baby because your baby has Down syndrome, right? I mean, it's pretty heavy stuff. The matter should be decided, if at all, on the basis and on that basis, and not allowed to depend on the essentially irrelevant question of whether uh, the intestinal tract is blocked. Last bit, and then we're done. I had to read all of this. This is an, an amazing, just amazing, just amazing writing. What makes this situation possible, of course, is the idea that when there is an intestinal blockage, one can let die, allow to die. When there's intestinal blockage, but when there is no such defect, there is nothing that can be done, for one must not kill. The fact that, the, the fact that this idea leads to such results as deciding life or death on irrelevant grounds is another good reason why the doctrine should be rejected. I mean, whatever words you give for articles, he should have gotten all of them. It's just amazing. I'm going to draw what he just said quickly. Because I think it was clear, but just to make sure that it's clear. We have DS Down Syndrome. We have two children with Down Syndrome. Both children are affected with Down Syndrome. This child has Down Syndrome with an intestinal blockage. This child does not. Since this child has, this was true at the time, this isn't true anymore. It doesn't matter that it's no longer relevant, the, uh, the idea is genius. And it was true at one time. This child has Down syndrome with an intestinal blockage, and obviously if that blockage isn't removed, then the child will die. Right? It's a very, he said it, it's a very simple procedure. You make an incision, you take out the blockage, you stitch up whatever, you stitch up whatever, you're done. The child's fine. Because the child had intestinal blockage, subtext again, not explicitly said, but should be said formally, because the child had intestinal blockage, the intestinal blockage became an excuse that both the parent and the medical community made 
for allowing the child to die because the child had Down syndrome. Now, I have to be careful, right, because I know there, I mean, 75 wasn't a long time ago. I mean, it was a long time ago, and there are probably, though I think the likelihood is very, very small, could be parents who lived through this, who unfortunately made this decision, or fortunately, however they want to interpret their lives. So I, I am trying to be sensitive to my audience. But the idea, to be just flat out honest, it's just, to be honest, these childs that were these children that were allowed to die because of intestinal blockage, you have to acknowledge the fact that they were allowed to die because they have Down syndrome. Rachel says, for those individual children who had Down syndrome without any intestinal blockage, you couldn't just let those babies lay on the bed and wither away and die. You couldn't do that. I would go one step further than Rachel's and talk about children who didn't have Down syndrome. So there's no Down syndrome present here, but did have intestinal blockage. I guarantee you that the intestinal blockage would have been removed because otherwise the normal the child was normal. Right? So just to even take it a step further. So intestinal blockage coupled with Down syndrome, intestinal blockage used as an excuse to kill the child for having Down syndrome, and this allowing to die is the state of withering away, and as Anthony Shaw says, the parents are never going to be in the room to actually see what manifests. He's a medical practitioner, he's been there, he's seen it, and he's like, it is horrendous what allowing to die looks like, what it smells like, how long it takes, hours and days. Right? For children who don't have intestinal blockage but do have Down syndrome, you can't allow them to die. And for children who don't have Down syndrome but do have intestinal blockage, you're required to remove the blockage. So clearly, the point is, you're killing children that have Down syndrome. You can't do that. You can't do that. I feel good, about, like the universe is going to bless me for this lecture series because you just can't do that. And you should know that you can't do that, right? We should have known better. So, you know, Rachel's, Rachel's, Rachel's insight is just amazing. Uh, and he changed this article. So for graduate students, you don't think three or four pages is a super short article, probably four or five pages long can change the world, it, this article changed the world, right? And the basis of the article is, is conceptual, and half of the article, the second half that we're going to talk about right now, is completely hypothetical. He creates a hypothetical, sort of ridiculous story to justify, justify a point, and it works. So, you know, there is a lot of power in analytic, theoretical, hypothetical thinking. So, I read the extended quote. Okay, so now I'm going to read the, the next hypothetical quote. A lot of this I just have to read from the text because, I mean, it's just genius, so why not read from the text? Um, so here's the, here's the Jane, the Jones, it's not James, I think it's Jones. Yeah, here's the um, Smith-Jones example. Okay. Smith-Jones example. Okay, so top of page 24, if you're following along in the text. So let us, right, first line, right at the top. So let us consider um, the following case. In the first, Smith stands, so I'll actually draw this now. In the first, Smith stands to gain a large inheritance if anything should happen to his six-year-old cousin. So, and let me do it. Large inheritance uh, happen to cousin, he gains a large inheritance. Right? If something happens to his cousin, then he gains a large inheritance. Right? So Smith stands to gain a huge sum of money if something tragic happens to his cousin. So. Um, in, in the first, Smith stands to gain a large inheritance if anything should happen to his six-year-old cousin. One evening, while the child is taking his bath, Smith sneaks into the bathroom and drowns the child. It's pretty horrific, right? Kid's taking a bath, Smith goes into the bathroom, drowns the child, and then arranges things so that it looks like an accident. In the second, Jones also stands to gain 
anything. Jane, 